There are three points today that I want to share with you that we're going to reflect upon. Three points. The first is no greater love. Number two, no greater life. And number three, no greater promise. As Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, than one who lays down their life for a friend. You know, there are many different expressions of love in the world today. There are many different kinds of love that we express. There are many different things that we have in our lives that we love. Amen? Many of us here today love our families, don't we? Parents love their children. We as Christians love the Lord. Amen? Those of us that have called America their homeland love the freedom that America represents, don't we? There are so many different kinds of love. We love certain kinds of food. And Americans love a good barbecue, don't they? You know, Dawn and I often joke and said, if we had a second calling in life, maybe it would be to own a food truck. And I've already picked out the name of mine. It would be called Holy Smokes. Because I love to barbecue. But you know, God has called us to something greater. And even though I love to barbecue and those things, there is a love that is greater than all of these other things in life that we love and enjoy. Some of us love vacation. Some of us love education. Some of us love to laugh and enjoy a good time. Some of us love just hanging out with family and friends. Some of us love a good cup of coffee in the morning. Don't get around them if they don't have that first cup of coffee, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. But in the original language, there are at least four different descriptions for love that are given. There is a brotherly love that is uh, often uh, called a phileo love. There is a love that is between friends. There is a sacrificial type of love that the Bible talks about, which is an agape love. And you know, whether or not we talk about love there is a love that is the greatest, and that's what Jesus was referring to when he said this in John chapter 15 and verse 13. There's an agape or agape love that is the sacrificial love. This kind of love is a love that puts others before yourself. This is the kind of love that Jesus was describing when he says, No greater love hath one than this, than they were willing to put down their very life for another. How many of you know that love is not a descriptive word? Love is an action Amen. word. Amen. And the kind of love that we're talking about is a love that is an action. When you love someone, it's not just enough to tell them that you love them. Yes, if you care to send the very best, you send Hallmark. But if you don't write your own words in that card, it's just words. But how many of you know that our, our, our wives, men, are looking for something more than just a card and just telling them that we love them? They want action behind the word. Amen, sister. I heard one back there. Amen. I know my wife wants more than just words on paper. She's looking for action. The Bible speaks much about the topic of love. For we know that the greatest example that is given in all of Scripture is that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son. In the Song of Solomon, it says, in Song of Songs 6, verse 3, it says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Did you ever read the, the Song of Solomon? It's a difficult uh, book to read if you're reading it with your earthly mind. I'll just be honest with you, because it's an allegory. It's a, a spiritual type written about the, the church in Christ, but it was also about real characters, Solomon and the Shunammite woman that he, he married. And so when we read the Song of Solomon, there's a great typology about what represents the relationship between ourselves and Jesus Christ. And it's a very beautiful narrative if you look at it in that sense. But it also had a physical reality as it described the love affair between Solomon and one of his many wives. And so we see in the Song of Solomon, it says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Can we say that this morning about our relationship to the Lord? 
Can you say with as much confidence that Jesus is mine and I belong to him? I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. In Song of Solomon 8, verse 7, it says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it out. He goes on to describe it this way. If a man gave everything that he owned to buy love, it would not be enough. Because love truly is the greatest, is it not? In John chapter 15, verses 9 through 12 and 13, Jesus said this to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Therefore, he says, abide in my love. How many of us can truly say that we abide in the love of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You know, Jesus didn't just say these words. Jesus took action and he demonstrated those words. How did he demonstrate them? But by dying for us on the cross. And it was there that upon the cross when Jesus stretched out his arms, he said, was saying to the world, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we're reminded in this often as we read through the scripture that the greatest theme in all of scripture is that of God's amazing love. And we just sang about it, the reckless love of God. What is that all about? How could God's love be reckless? Think about that. Do we deserve God's love? Is there anything within us that is worthy of God giving His only begotten Son to be tortured, beaten, and pierced, and put on a cross? Nothing. That's why the, with the, the title of that song is The Reckless Love of God. How could God love people so imperfect as we are? That's the amazing truth of God's amazing love. It is incredible, and it is beyond our comprehension. Jesus goes on to tell us in verse 12, This is my commandment. What commandment is that? That you love one another as I have loved you. I want this to sink in just for a moment. If Jesus was willing to love us to the point of death, are we ready to willing and to love each other in that same way? Because that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. As I have loved you, what limits did Jesus put to his love? What parameters did Jesus place ahead before he said you could come to the cross and receive forgiveness for your sins? What stipulations were, were, were having to be paid in order for us to, to come and freely receive of the gift that God would give to us through Jesus? The answer is Jesus put none other than a willingness to receive it. And this which makes the love of God so truly great for us is that greater love Jesus expressed as this, that no man can have than to lay down his life for a friend. Isn't that an amazing truth that God calls us his friends? That means as often as I have fallen short of God's uh, commandments, as often as I have sh fallen short of other people's expectations, come on, God still loves us. As often as I have broken His law, as often as I have fallen short of the mark of His holiness, God's love remains the one thing that is constant. If you don't believe me, read the story about the prodigal son. What did the father do when he looked out daily looking for the son as he looked and gazed upon the horizon? What was the father doing? Was he rehearsing a speech to condemn him? We find that in this illustrative parable, Jesus gives us a great image of what our Abba, Father's love, is like for us. That even a son that took the great inheritance and, and, and spilt and spent it all and squandered it and even brought the family name into question. He was treated even better than the servant. Even the son realized he was not worthy to go back 
and to reclaim the position that he once had. Does, doesn't that resonate with anybody here today? Did you ever feel condemned by your sin that you weren't worthy to come back and ask God to forgive you yet again? I know I have. And oftentimes our sin is what condemns us. Our sin is what causes us to not come back to a loving God and say, Father, have mercy on me once again. And so demonstrated and illustrated through that parable is the great love of the Father as he gazed out and he saw the Son coming even when he was a far way. The Father didn't sit there waiting, tapping his foot. I've been waiting for this moment, Son, for a long time. No, what do we read? We read that the Father took off and he ran towards the Son. I want none of us to forget today that none is greater than our Father's love for you and me. None is greater, no matter what sin you have committed, no matter what situation you may be facing, none is greater than our Father's love. For when the Father greeted the Son, he embraced him and put his arms around him and didn't even allow the son to rehearse the speech that he had said about not coming back as a son, but maybe being hired as a servant. The father didn't even give him an opportunity to say that. He says, my son that was lost has now been found. The son that was dead is now alive. Let's put a robe on him. Let's put a finger, a, a, a ring on his finger, and let's celebrate for the son that was lost has been found. What an amazing picture of God's love for us. But how do we love one another? You know, I, I know that my love has limitations. Can I just be honest? I love when people love me back. I, I love to, to hear encouraging words. But we're not just called to love those that will love us in the way that we have loved them. Jesus said we're even to love those who come against us and even persecute us, even those that we would not call lovely, but those that we would call our enemy. Now I'm going to go there in just a moment. How do Christians love? Do we not have conditions? Do we not at times forget that we ourselves, from the pit that we were dug, that we all came from the same stuff? And so sometimes we have conditions upon the love that we will express to one another, but the love of God was expressed perfectly for us on the cross of Jesus, that God held nothing back in his love for us. And it was that love that brings transformation, and it is that love that brought us closer to the Lord. And you know, we as Christians sometimes need to lead in the way of love, but we have forgotten the way of love, that's why I'm reminding us here today that Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. It doesn't say love one another as your neighbor has loved you. It doesn't say love one another as your, your mom and dad has loved you. No, it says love one another as I have loved you. And so in saying this, Jesus in Mark chapter 12, we also read, that Jesus was speaking in parables. He spoke about the wicked vine dresser, how when the, uh, the, the, the uh, owner of the vineyard went away, he had pointed those that would work. And instead, when the, when the son of the vine dresser or, or of the owner came, they, they, they killed him because they did not respect him. And so then Jesus tells him, uh, the, 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 those that were there were trying to trap Jesus and asking Jesus that question by holding up a coin saying, is it lawful to pay taxes? And Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, but give to God the things that belong to God. And then again, in Mark chapter 12 and verse 28, the, the scribes had come to Jesus asking him, what is the first commandment? In this, in verse 29, Jesus summarizes the entirety of the law and the prophets by saying this, the first of all commandments is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord, let's say that together, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first, and the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you stop reading there, you miss the great part. There is no commandment, Jesus said, greater than these. Let me tell you what is the greatest thing that we have been given as Christians is the love of the Father. And the greatest source we have been given is the love of God. And the greatest mission that we have been given in the world is to love one another. Even the Apostle Paul's writing, as he's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and the importance of gifts. But what comes right in the middle is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, But the greatest of these is love. There's no greater love. Can you say amen to that? The second part is this. There's no greater life. When we read the Old Covenant of the Law and we look here at the Old Testament, the Law of Moses was given as an instrument to help man understand the nature of the true and living God. But when we look at the Law, the Law always brought this same result. The Law always brought men under judgment. And when men received judgment, it also brought death. And under the Old Covenant was the law. And the Bible said this, under the law, the soul that sins is going to die. But then Jesus ushered in a brand new covenant, a new revelation. And when we understand this covenant and revelation, the Bible begins by telling us with the coming of Jesus that God so loved that he gave Jesus, right? And the message of the cross is this, his death, brings us to life, and not just any ordinary life, but a life that is life to the full. In 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4, it says like this, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power, listen to this, has given to us all things. Say all things. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Through the one who called us by glory and virtue, by whom we have been given to us exceedingly, listen to this, exceedingly great and precious promises that even though You are partakers of the divine nature. Think about that. We get to partake in the divine nature of God. You are never more like Him than when you love one another. You are never more like God when you show love to someone who doesn't deserve it. You are never more like God than when you love even those who persecute you. You are never more like God when you love those who are unlovely, even to the least of these. This is the greater life that God has called us to and this great promise. I believe that, I hope that they still have my illustration possibly up on the computer. Did you guys set it down? (laughs) I'm giving you warning if they can bring it up again. But I know that so many people during this past week, we're so enamored looking on the television at the great royal wedding of Prince Harry and Princess Meghan. Everybody loves a good love story, don't they? And when you think about the coverage that was given, the whole world literally stopped for about a week and was following the story of these two people and about their amazing love and how many people would, 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 were just infatuated about this royal wedding. Maybe, maybe you didn't care at all. But I know the world did. Because every time I turned on the television, there was something about it. Am I telling the truth? And everybody was, was so enamored about this tremendous story. So you know what I did? I, I, I DVR'd it. I recorded I didn't have time to sit down and watch it when it was playing because I believe it was early one morning, I think it was on the Saturday we had our volleyball 
tournament. So I wasn't going to sit down and watch four hours of, of that wedding. But I know that many people did. And you know, it is a great illustration for us to understand what we have received when we receive Jesus Christ into our lives. There is no greater promise that the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian church than that which is in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32. Paul says this, This is the great mystery I speak concerning Christ and the church. What is the mystery that, that Paul is talking about? That there's going to be a wedding one day, a royal wedding that is going to take place between Jesus and his bride. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And in that royal wedding, Jesus, the groom, is going to marry his bride called the church. And there's going to be a royal wedding. Does anybody know when that wedding is about to take place? It takes place in the book of Revelation at the Lamb's uh, uh, reception there. There's a, there's a royal wedding that takes place in the book of Revelation. And I want to just take this moment because it was a powerful moment that illustrated for me what really is about to take place for all of us. Do they have the video up? I think it's at around the second minute mark. We're going to just play this for a moment. And some of you, I hope it, it doesn't make your stomach turn if you don't like love stories. But I just thought it's interesting as they share their vows to one another. I want you to listen very carefully to what is being said. Let these rings be to Harry and Meghan a symbol of unending love and faithfulness to remind them of the vow and covenant which they have made this day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Megan, I give you this ring. Megan, I give you this ring. As a sign of our marriage. As a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. With my body, I honor you. All that I am, I give to you. All that I am, I give to you. And all that I have. And all that I have. I share with you. I share with you. Within the love of God. Within the love of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Harry, I give you this ring. Harry, I give you this ring. As a sign of our marriage. As a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. With my body, I honor you. All that I am, I give to you. All that I am, I give to you. And all that I have. And all that I have. I share with you. I share with you. Within the love of God. Within the love of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me ask the question, who got the better deal in that vow? Oh, you laugh. Let me ask you this question. The whole world stopped and was abuzz about the fact that one life was about to be transformed in the instant that this wedding took place. What am I talking about? A girl that was going to make history, a non-royal, an American, a girl of origin who had already been previously been married once before, who, who had no ties to royalty, who came from a family that was broken because of divorce. And this would be unheard of a hundred years ago in the royal family. To think about how one such as this would be considered even worthy to marry into royalty. But what a picture that demonstrates what Christ has done for his church. That in the moment that a wedding was about to take place, where Christ was putting an engagement finger upon the church, that we are betrothed to him. This is the mystery that Paul is talking about. There's an engagement that has already taken place through the covenant of Christ's blood for his church. And the Bible is pointing to a moment that is coming 
when the bride and the bridegroom are going to be married together. I want you to just reflect upon those words when Harry said to her, all that I am, I give to you. Is exactly what the church received from Jesus Christ. You and I, our entire past in an instant, in a moment, in a twinkling, forever changed. No matter what your origin was, whether you were, had a, a broken past, whether or not you were good enough, in that moment that he said, I do, her life forever changed. And let me tell you, that touched me and it blessed my wife and I. When we watched that in that moment, I said, that is the closest thing on this earth to what Jesus Christ has done for every single one of us. Your past is no more. And in that moment, you have received royal riches, hallelujah, at Christ's expense. It is a beautiful type of what we have received as believers. In the moment that Jesus shed his blood, we became engaged to him. We belong to him. Our ownership belongs to him. But the Bible talks about this in Ephesians 5.22. It says, Husband, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify it and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he may present to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but would be holy and without blemish, perfect, absolutely perfect. If you have your Bibles, I would have you now turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, where we get a glimpse of this great image of what is yet to take place. There is no greater promise of our engagement to Christ than the promise of marriage to Christ. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6, reading from the NIV, it says, A great multitude was heard like the roar of rushing waters and like peals of thunder. Let me tell you, some peals of thunder woke me up this morning. I don't know about you, my house was shaking. And I said, Yes, Lord. This is exactly what Revelation 9, 6 is talking about. Peals of thunder. This is no ordinary wedding that's going to take place. Like peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty. He reigns. Rejoice and be glad. Give Him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean and prepared. Verse 9, the angel said, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Now as nice and as uh, followed that wedding was there in the Buckingham Palace and the various palaces there where this wedding took place, let me tell you, it pales in comparison to what is awaiting you and me. It pales in comparison to what that wedding of the Lamb is going to be like when all of, of, of the nations are gathered together from every tongue and from every tribe and every kindred. They're all going to be adorned wearing the same thing, white and bright linens, which speaks of the purity and the holiness that the Holy Spirit has given to His bride. She has been washed and she has been made ready and she is there to be united forever with the Lord. What a day of a great promise that we have and that we possess. But I also want to put you in remind that in this life that we are now living, even though we are looking for that marriage of the Lamb, we have all the riches of Christ at our disposal. We have all that He is available to us. And it begins with the relationship of love with Christ. There is none greater, there is no greater love of God for us, no greater love, no greater life, and there is no greater promise than the promise that we have in Christ. It begins with love, and it ends with love, and love is the greatest because God himself is love. Can you thank him for that this morning?
You know, it is my desire that we as a church grow in love with the Lord. If there's one thing that the Lord has been impressing upon me is that if you love someone, you want to give them your everything. When you love someone, you want to spend time with them. When you love someone, their interests become your interests. As, as corny as that may sound, it is the truth. And I know it because my son, he, he snickers when he finds the letters that I wrote my wife when we were in college. I wrote some corny stuff. I'm just being real. I wrote her poetry. I wrote her, and you know why? Because the things that interest her were the things that interest me. There's something about a love that we need to have rekindled in our hearts again for the Lord. Because I know that the Bible tells us that His appearing is going to come in a moment that we're not looking for it, and perhaps we're going to be engrossed in something else that has captivated our love other than Him. You know, the Bible describes it, it will come like a thief in the night, in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. That's when the trumpet is going to blast, and it's going to be too late at that moment to get down on your knees and to say to the Lord that you love Him. You see, a love affair is something that you carry not just at one moment in your life, but it is something that carries forward into your life. I've not stopped loving my wife since the days that we were in college or when I came here to the altar. I have continued to love her. And I continue to demonstrate. You know, sometimes we say that that we fall out of love. No, 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 no. Love is a choice. Love is a commitment. Love is something that is not just fleeting in the moment. You know, you can start together and not end up together because we forget to love the way that God intended for us to love. If I only loved my wife on my wedding, I would not still be married today. If I stopped demonstrating ways to her that I love her other than my words, I would not be standing here today. And we as the church need to get captivated again in how great our Father's love is for us that we would never lose the wonder of Christ and His amazing love for His bride called the church. It is a reckless love. And you know, there is one thing about love that is often not mentioned, but it is mentioned in Scripture, and it relates to one of the names of God least known, and that is jealous. God is jealous for our love just as much as a spouse is jealous for her spouse's love. You see, there can be no competition when it comes to the love that a husband and wife join together. Great is this mystery, Paul says, between Christ and the church. God is jealous for our love, and God wants to awaken in us, I believe, a holy love, a love that is understanding that what we do and who we are is more than what we say. It's an active love. It's an active love. It's an action. And you know, you can love God by prayer. You can love God by reading His Word. You can love God by serving one another. You can love God by doing what the Word says. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, than one who is willing to lay down his life. But before we could even get to that point, Jesus says, The one that loves me is the one that obeys me. Is there growth for our love? I believe that there is. I believe that God is calling us back to love. I believe that God is calling us to consider what are the interests in our lives, what are the other competing loves that would drown out His love? Because He's jealous. God wants to be first. God wants to to receive our best, not what's left. God wants us to demonstrate each and every day an opportunity to love God more and to love Him with all of our heart, with all of our mind. What did it say? And with all of our strength. Do we love God in that kind of way? I believe that as Christians we received no example, we received an example of no greater love, no greater promise than than the promise of God's love. 
And there's no greater life that we can live than one that is completed with the love of God. I don't know about you, but I want God's love to be renewed in my heart day by day. Hallelujah. And so what are some of the things that compete for God's love? Is our love for ourselves. One of the greatest loves, if we're really truthful about our hearts, is not the love that we have for others, but the love that we have for ourselves. It's a selfish love. It's looking out for our interests instead of the interest of others. It's wanting to be first instead of taking a humble position and put others in front. You see, there are so many different ways and so many different expressions of self-love, but a godly love is a sacrificial love, sacrificing self for others. And this is the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated when he demonstrated it not only on the cross, but he demonstrated it again and again throughout his life and ministry. Not as I will, but as thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to ask you today to consider the love of God in your own life. Is that love as vibrant as it was when you first began? If not, there may be causes in why that love has diminished. There can be competing things that can be caused as a reason why that love has diminished. And so we need to take careful examination of our own hearts and not consider anybody else's heart. If you're a husband and wife and maybe one of you feels unloved, consider what you're giving before you consider what you're getting. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If you feel unloved, it may be that you're not giving what needs to be given in order to receive what it is that you want to receive. How many of you know that if you love someone, you do what's right for them first? And you do it as often as it is required or needed. You don't do it with the expectation of receiving something in return. And if we love God, we will love him in the same way. We will love him by putting him first, and we will love him by putting ourselves second. You know, we as Christians need to understand that God gave us everything. And what did he get in return? But broken pieces and broken lives. But that demonstrates the greatness of our God's love. Like Harry, God didn't get what he gave. He gave, and look what he's going to get. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, a bride that is from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, as far as the eye can see, a multitude without number, dressed in white and ready to be clothed in that love of God that is eternal. And so I'm going to ask you to join with me today in loving God and coming to examine your own heart today, that you would love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And anything less than that is not worthy of God's love. But God, he never gives up on us. His love never runs out on us. His love remains a constant for us. And his love is what truly transforms us. If we were to look around this room and every person tell their story, we would probably be in amazement. We would probably stand in awe of the transformation that took place. But it's only love that can change us. It's the love of the Father, the love of the Son, and the love of the Holy Spirit that can reform us and make us a new creation in Christ. I'm going to ask that you would bow your hearts with me And let's look to the Lord. Father, this is a moment of reflection. This is a moment that requires consecration and dedication. This is a moment, God, where it requires us to examine our own hearts. Oh, God, your love is amazing. 
It is wonderful. It's beyond comprehension. God, may there be many of us today that need to be renewed in that love and to be restored by that love. That love that forgives and sets free. That love that cancels sin. And though we might be unclean, be washed by the pure washing of the water by the word. God, if there are areas of our lives that we are growing more and more selfish and centered on our own thoughts, to have our own way, looking out for our own interest instead of the interest of others, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction to us and draw us back to yourself. God, give us a love that is pure, a love like yours that is unending, a love that is eternal, just as you yourself are eternal. For your love never ends, and it never gives up on us. Father, I thank you that, Lord, today there are those here today that your love can reach down and change, and your love can bring a brand new beginning. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity for a new beginning and a fresh start. And perhaps today there is someone here that is not experiencing the love that their heart longs for. God wants to fill your heart with love. He wants to overwhelm us with his amazing love. It's that same love that can transform a life like Megan into the life of a church that is without spot or wrinkle. He, can, he alone can cancel our past and give us a love that is present, that will never leave us, and a love that will never forsake us. His love is greater than the love of a father. His love is the greater love than a spouse. His love is a greater love than a boyfriend or a girlfriend. His love is an amazing love. And his love is available for us today. Father, I pray that you would pour out your love today upon those hearts that are searching, those hearts, God, that desire to receive more of yourself. God, may you draw us by your precious Holy Spirit. May you reveal your love through your word, through your witness, and God, through action. The action that you would give in our own hearts and the action that we would have in loving one another. May this church, Lord, be filled with that kind of love. May our hearts and our homes and our families be filled with that kind of love. May your love be the love that outshines all other loves in our lives. God, give us a deepening love. Give us an abiding love. Give us a love that is enduring and love that never ends. For we pray this in Jesus' name.